Now, what in the Bible are the characteristics that God is looking for in a local church? What are the characteristics of a local church that desires to be faithful to Scripture in its life and ministry? As also last Sunday, I mentioned that for us to better understand our three months, we need to be on the same page on what or about the question, what is the church and why is it important? And we have defined the local church as a gathering of people who believe in Jesus as Savior and Lord, who have committed themselves to worship, to meet regularly, to worship, to teach, to study the Word of God, and to disciple people. Now, we're, today, we're going to study the importance of biblical church leadership. And I want to tell you that this is not a peripheral issue. It is a gospel issue. It is vital that every one of us become characterized as disciples who love the Word of God, who are captured by the Word of God. Our thoughts, our imaginations, our dreams, our beliefs, our faith are captive to the Word of God. And how are we going to have that? Well, God has appointed leaders in the church to teach his word. You see, when the gospel takes hold of a, of a man's life, it leads to growth in grace. In the areas of discipleship, service, and loving people. But God knows that that growth in grace needs all the mutual help and accountability that we all could possibly get. And in his goodness, God appoints leaders in the church to edify us, to encourage us, and to help us grow in grace. So today, we are going to see who is the boss, who is the CEO of GCF Northeast or other local churches, and how does he exercise his headship over the church, and also our responsibility as members of the local church. But before we continue, let's commit this time to the Lord. Our gracious, loving Father, we again come to you in the name of Jesus, our Savior and Lord. Teach us by your word. We want to be Christ-like, not only in our individual lives, but also in our life together as a church. Would you please open the eyes of our hearts that we will behold the truth and transform our hearts by that same truth. Empower me. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So in your bulletin, there are three points. The first is Christ is the head of the church. There are different views among Christians when it comes to church government. It's with biblical support. The Episcopalian model uh, or the Anglican, it's hierarchical. All right? There is a one leader on top. There's the Archbishop of Canterbury, and then below him are Cardinals, Archbishop, Archbishops, and uh, Cardinals. And then we have the Presbyterian form of government, which is not so hierar hierarchical, but has levels of authority. In a local church, they have uh, the session. And then a group of churches or district governed by synod. And then they have the General Assembly. The independent system views its church as autonomous, not subject to outside authority. But some independent churches, like the Southern Baptist, they join larger associations or conventions, and they adhere to certain doctrines and practices. Our church is affiliated with the Conservative Baptist Association. And it's a cooperative uh, association of Baptist churches, congregationally governed. But we, they don't have authority over us. We have the board of elders and also the board of deacons. Now, all of the different systems of church government recognize Christ as the head of the church. The differences emerge when it comes to how the Lord exercises his, exercises his headship. But we need to think carefully about the practical ramifications of Jesus heading the church. As I've said last Sunday, this church is not my church. 
This is the Lord's church. Pastors don't own church. Pastors are under the headship of Christ. By the same token, this church is not your church. If you're a member of this church, I'm so happy to know that. If you're a member of this church for a long time, I'm so happy to know that. If you're giving generously to support the different ministries of the church, praise the Lord. If you are serving in the different ministries of this church, praise the Lord. Brothers and sisters in Christ, but even so, it is not your church. In the sense of ownership, it is Christ's church. He is the head of the living organic body. He purchased this church with his own blood. I hope that we're all committed in to this church, that we all serve this church, but also let us also give to support this church. But this is not your church. It belongs to Jesus Christ. He is the head of the body and the king over his people. And this means the main function of church government is to allow Christ to exercise his headship over his church. If an issue arises from the church, the question should be what is in the mind of the, it should not be what is in the mind of the members, but what is in the mind of the Lord of the church. The mind of Christ is given to us in his word. We may differ on how we apply the scripture, the, interpret, the, the application of the scripture to a particular text. But we must all place ourselves under Jesus Christ as our supreme authority. Now, allowing Christ to exercise his authority over the church results in an entirely different approach or way of conducting church business. If the members of the church are living daily, surrendering daily to the Lord, and also obeying, seeking to obey his word, then when they meet together to conduct a business meeting or church business, they deny self and reverently ask the Lord what he's saying to the church. So who is the CEO of the church of GCF Northeast? The Lord Jesus Christ. But how does he exercise his headship? Originally, the apostles appointed elders in the church that they have founded. In Acts 14, 23, when they had appointed elders for them in every church, having prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Later, Paul gave two of his apostolic delegates, Timothy and Titus, the list detailing the qualities to look for men whom they can appoint as elders. In 1 Timothy 3, 1 to 7, which we have read, and Titus 1, verses 5 to 9. Since we no longer have apostolic delegates, we should seek to appoint as elders men who meet the qualifications in those two uh, texts or passages. The two lists, 1 Timothy 3, 1, 7, and Titus 1, 5 to 9, are very similar, although they are not identical. I don't know why. The lists are probably not, to meant, are not meant to be exhaustive. The significant thing about both lists is that except for the ability to teach God's word, both lists focus on godly character, not our spiritual gifts, not abilities or talents. Alexander Strauss wrote, What God prizes among the leaders of his people is not education, wealth, social status, success, or even great spiritual gifts. Rather, he values personal, moral, and spiritual character. Therefore, the issue in church government is not whom you like, but rather does this man possess the quality set down on scripture to function in his office. Again, let me repeat that. The issue in church government is not whom you like, but rather does this person possess the qualifications set down in scripture to function in the office. I remember my professor, even Dr. Nari Santos, when we were selecting for elders, he asked us, you tell or you, uh, you ask the wives and the children of those who are 
in that position, to be nominated in that position, if they are really having their personal devotion, if they are really reading the word of God, if they are really praying, you ask the family because they are the ones who really know those, those men. Brothers and sisters of Christ, of course, no one possesses all the qualifications perfectly, but a man should not glaringly violate any of those qualifications, and he must generally match them. The members of the church are also charged with holding elders accountable, both morally and doctrinally. If an elder is acting in ways contrary, morally contrary to Scripture, or teaching doctrines that is contrary to Scripture, then church members need to talk to him. So what do you do if someone approaches you with something damaging against me, against any of the elders, or some Christian leader? It is important for the testimony of Christ that we handle it in such a godly way. If the person is spreading rumors or gossip, then he must be corrected. But if there is a legitimate concern, if he has a legitimate problem, it needs to be processed according to Scripture. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 5.19, Do not receive an accusation against an elder except on the basis of two or three witnesses. A case must be tried on the basis of factual evidence. So if the person says, uh, Brad, si Pastor Boyet parang may, may konting ganyan eh. Oh, anong evidensya mo? Ayan, nakabikini siya. Oh. Oh, diba? Na, or si Pastor nagturo, wrong doctrine. Uh, Brother Joseph is always uh, recording. No, yung atin pong. So you can check. Alright? But there should be a factual evidence. You, there should be a factual evidence. Why? Paul specifically applies this to church leaders. Because they are liable to false accusation and slander, especially those who teach and preach the Word of God. Satan is always trying to discredit the authority of the Word of God. And one of the ways that he, do, he does this is to attack the credibility of the teacher, of the preacher here in the pulpit. If people doubt his integrity, if people doubt the integrity of your pastor, if the people did doubt the integrity of those who preach here, then they can easily shrug off any exhortation on holiness and godliness. But we'll discuss this more on April 15, or April 8, and April 15. April 1, it's Resurrection Sunday. April 8, we'll talk about resolution of conflicts. April 15, we'll talk about uh, current trends that affect our view on the church. But what I'm saying here. If, we, if you hold your, your, your board, the elders, the leaders of the church accountable, then you should know the Bible well so that you can easily spot any, any deviation from the truth, whether morally or doctrinally. Members should not be unconcerned if there is moral, lack, if, if, if moral laxity or doctrinal error seep into the church. But if the elders are following the Lord, Elders should be obeyed, but they do not have autocratic authority to lord it over the church, and I won't allow that too. Rather, they are to be examples to the flock. Elders must be men, not women. That's another observation. I was asked several Saturdays ago by some women in the church why we Baptists don't allow women as elders. First, there is no example in the New Testament of women elders. Perhaps people who prioritize equality for all people, they say or argue that this is just a cultural or it was merely cultural so that the early church did not offend the male-dominated society of that time. But in the context of the church, Paul wrote, but I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man and the man is the head of a woman and God is the head of Christ. He goes on to base this teaching on the order of creation where the man and women, woman must reflect the image of God. The hierarchy, hierarchy of authority in the Godhead is the pattern for the hierarchy of authority in the church and in marriage. 
To be the head does not imply or tolerate superiority or abuse of authority of men over women. Rather, the church and the home must reflect the image of the Godhead. An example, although the Lord Jesus Christ is equal to the Father, He willingly submitted to the Father to carry out the divine plan. And He will be subject to the Father throughout eternity, but they are equal. Okay? In 1 Timothy 2, 11, 12, Paul instructed, a woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. But I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. Again, modern evangelical feminists argue that this was culturally conditioned. But Paul goes on to base that his instruction, Sanya Pubines, on the order of creation. Who was the first one created? Eve? Adam. So it was man. And this is historical. It is not cultural. Also, the qualifications listed in 1 Timothy 3, 1, 7, which we just read, and also Titus 1, 5 to 9, assume that elders will be men. Paul used the masculine pronoun. Elder must be the husband of one wife and should manage his own household well. So the basic principle in church governance is that Jesus is the head. And he exercises his headship over church-recognized, spiritually mature elders. So what are the elders supposed to do? The main task of elders is to lead through example and teaching as they shepherd God's flock. Why is it that elders are needed to shepherd God's flock? Can you open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 to 13? Do we have it? And he gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of service, to building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Why is it that elders are needed? To shepherd the flock of God. Paul says, he gave apostles in verse 11, pastors and teachers. You may ask, pastors, asan doon ang elders? Wala naman sinabing elders doon. Now, what do you call a pastor? He is a shepherd. What did Paul call the elders in Acts 20:28? Shepherds. What was the one competency that he required for, of elders in 1 Timothy 3 2? Teachers. So, what are elders? They are pastor teachers, they are shepherd teachers. And when we are going to nominate elders, this is the last cycle of the board of elders. And then after that, we're going to select. We should select pastor teachers and shepherd teachers. That's what elders are. Now, why did Jesus give pastor teachers? For the equipping of the saints for the work of service. For the equipping of the saints for the work of service. He didn't give elders to you to do your work. God has given us the elders to what? Equip you to do what God has called you to do in the church. And in all of life. He knew. God knew that we needed edification. And so elders. He gave you. He gave you elders in order to edify you. They are to be pastor teachers. They are to be shepherd teachers. So what will happen? Sabi niya. So that the body of Christ is built up. Isn't that an important task? Of course it is. The Lord Jesus Christ bought his, bought his church with his own blood. And now he looks at the elders, the pastor's teachers, the shepherd, the shepherd teachers. I bought this church with my blood and I want you to take care of it. I want you to equip them so that my body will be built up. 
That's why the author of Hebrews 13, 17, again, the, another passage that we've read, the author of this, 1 Timothy, Paul, the author of James, in James chapter 2, they are saying, you know what those elders, you know what those leaders are, you know what those officers are, they will give an account to God for how they edified you. It may be an awesome job to be an elder, but it is also scary because they will give an account to God. But please again understand that having mature, spiritually mature elders is a gospel thing. The gospel works in the elders' lives. And what do these elders do? They become men of the word of God. They love the word of God. They eat the word of God. They delight in the word of God. They love the whole counsel of God. And these elders are men captured by God by his grace. They love the word and they teach the word to their congregation. And we need that as a congregation. Why? Because we believers should be lovers of the word of God. We should want to eat the word of God, to know the word of God, to meditate on the word of God, to ponder upon the word of God, to memorize scripture. We want it to permeate in our lives so that we think Bible, we act Bible, we believe Bible. Instinctively, the Bible becomes us, instinctive for us. But it won't become distinctive if we don't esteem it, if we don't learn it. And so God has given us elders, pastor teachers, shepherd pastors, so that the Bible can become a part of us, so that God's truth presses deep into our hearts and out of our lives. We need the gospel work in our hearts and out of our lives. We need to understand that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. While we were, we need to understand, brothers and sisters in Christ, that he who knew no sin to be seen for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. We need to understand that God sent his son, that he died for our sins, that on the third day, according to scriptures, he was raised from the dead. And in his, in his death, he defeated sin, and in his resurrection, he defeated death. Sin and death lie on the feet of Jesus. He defeated them both. So we need to understand the gospel. And for us to understand the gospel, God has given us elders, pastor teachers, and shepherd teachers. Every healthy church needs shepherd teachers, edifying the congregation in the whole counsel of God in the truth of the gospel. So having these men, mature men, is a gospel issue. And lastly, what is our duty then? If Jesus is the head and he exercises his headship through the elders, what is the duty of the congregation? Allow me to read verses 17, 18, and 19. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. Pray for us, for we are sure that we have a good conscience, desiring to conduct ourselves honorably in all things. And I urge you all the more to do this, so that I may be restored to you the sooner. We are to be a people characterized by respect for spiritual authority. Now, having just said that, I also said something that is countercultural. We live in a day and age where authority is not that respected anymore. For those of my age who grew up in the 60s and 70s, I'm sure you know, isang tingin ka lang, nanginginig ka na. Right, Kuya Sunny? Especially my uncle who is a policeman, he likes to make amba. You know amba? Opo, opo. Oh, natatawa yung mga kaedad ko. Diba? Nagiging bentot kami nung panahon na yon. Men in uniform, when they patrol the streets, we respect them. But now, MMDAs, they are being cursed. Policemen, 
they are even killed, murdered on the street. Have you heard obey and submit those two words in a sentence uh, uttered by a leader of our country? Obey and submit. You see, obey your leaders and submit to them is a difficult passage to speak on because also of our culture. Our culture is anti-authoritarian and it is also postmodern. And both ideas militate against submission and obedience. John Stott says, Seldom, if ever, in its long history has the world witnessed such a self-conscious revolt against authority. To prove Stott's statement, what comes to your mind when you hear the word authority and submission? Do you welcome them as pleasing or pleasant words? Or you tap your, your, your warning button to put up your guards? So the concept of submission to authority, to authority seems to be weak to us. Our culture is also influenced by postmodernism, which holds that there is no absolute truth and that each person is free to make up or interpret truth as he sees fit. So your truth, you have truth, it is fine with you. I also have my own truth, but don't oblige me to submit to your truth. That is postmodernism. You can believe as you like, but I can also believe as I like. Then truth is not authoritative. Brothers and sisters in Christ, for us, the Bible is absolute authority. No, I am the authority over my life, they would say, and I use truth for my own ends. But against all these powerful influences in our culture, when we come to Hebrews 13, 17, it, it is a part of God's word, God-inspired word, and it is a command that is profitable for us. And so we must wrestle with them. Our verses are directed at church members, but implicitly for us leaders, there are certain duties as well. What is our responsibility or what are the responsibilities of church members? To obey and submit to church leaders. The Greek words for obey and submit mean obey and sub submit. The difference, if any, between the two is that obedience implies going along with direction or commands, whereas submission involves an attitude. You can obey outwardly, but if you are sitting with anger on the inside, then you are not submitting. Submission implies a sweet spirit of cooperation that stems from trust. Brothers and sisters in Christ, as members of GCFNE, you should trust that your leaders have your best interests at heart. The author of Hebrews gives us two reasons why we must obey our leaders. First, they keep watch over your soul. Obey your leaders and submit to them for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. God has again constitu constituted various levels of authority under his ultimate authority. The purpose for all authority is to protect and bless those under authority. For example, God instituted, establishes the authority of civil government to protect and bless law-abiding citizens from those who wanted to, hurt, to want, want to hurt them, harm them, or take advantage over them. When the government does its job, then crimes or criminals are punished. To the extent if the government neglects or is negle negligent or corrupt, then the citizens suffer. In the family, God has ordained husbands to have authority under Jesus Christ to protect and bless their wives and their children. The husband is to provide for his family, to protect his family from physical and spiritual danger, and to bless his family in leading them to God, in God's way. An ungodly husband will be answerable to God because he already abuses the authority that God has given him. In the church, God has appointed elders 
or again, pastor teachers, shepherd teachers, to oversee the flock. They are not to lord it over the church, but rather to be examples of the flock. So on every level, those in authority are still, they are not the absolute authority. Every leader will give an account to God. Now before we leave the subject of obedience and submission, let me be, let me be more specific on what it doesn't mean and what it does mean. First, it does not mean blindly following leaders without question. Even in a church that is seeking to obey, to follow the Bible, it is not wrong and it is right to examine scriptures to see if the teaching is sound, just like what the Bereans did in Acts 17.11. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I welcome interacting with anyone about my sermon, about the interpretation of the text, as long as you're seeking to be submissive and faithful in what the Bible teaches. I am not infallible. Your pastor is not perfect. I have not cornered all the truth of the gospel. But, brothers and sisters in Christ, submission to godly leadership would require that if you disagree with me on a secondary matter, if it is a non-essential issue, if you disagree with your board, with the elders, with the leaders of the church, you would be disobeying God to lead a faction against us. When is the church responsible to obey and submit? Obviously, when the leaders teach God's truth, especially on the essential doctrines and the commands of the faith, we all must submit. It is not the elder's authority, but God's authority that we must submit to. If it is an area where godly Christians differ, then let's have the grace to disagree. Again, allow me to repeat, but submission to godly leadership would require that if you disagree with me or the other leaders of the church on secondary matter, on non-essential doctrines, you would be disobeying God to lead a faction against us. There needs to be a respect shown toward the office of the pastor, towards those who preach and teach the word of God. Listen to what Paul says in Titus 2.15. These things speak and exhort and reprove, reprove with all authority. It's a commandment. Let no one disregard you. To disregard Titus, would have been to disregard God whose word Titus preached. Now, allow me to be practical. Allow me several, to say several situations where church members should submit to church leadership even if it is difficult. I remember when I first came here, I talked to the leaders of the exalting uh, team to check on the songs composed by Michael W. Smith. And I asked them, can you check Google research? Because uh, Michael W. Smith is a mason. And he flaunts it. Ano na ulit yung mga kanta ni Michael W. Smith? Nawala na yung praise team. Sila tinanong ko kanina, hindi na nila matandaan. Ibig sabihin, talaga nakalimutan na nila. Okay? Second, posting quotations from your walls of Authors who are anti-Christ, who are anti-religion, who are anti-faith. Please, don't do that. Check, Google first your author if he is with us. Third, posting quotations of preachers who adhere to uh, consumerism, anti-intellectualism, as uh, Pastor John would always say, or the postmodernist. I'll give you an example. We're going to talk about this on April 15. The views... The, the, the current trends that impact our view on the church. Consumerism, relativism, individualism, anti-intellectualism. The, the emphasis of the anti-intellectuals is, on on, is not on what divides, but what unites. They would say Christ is the Lord. He has been crucified, buried, risen. He is Savior. Now, let us just love one another. According to them, we go to church... Not to understand God, but to worship. We go to church not to articulate and defend 
our faith. Balang apologetics, Pastor John, sa mga anti-intellectuals. We go to church because we want to commune with fellow believers. If you ask them a question, is justification by grace through faith alone? They would say, wrong question, love Christ. What about those who have never heard of the gospel? They would say, don't put God in a box. We just love Christ. Is the scripture alone sufficient for our faith? They would say, not, irrelevant, uh, not relevant. Let us just love Christ. What is predestination? They would say, that is a mystery. Let us just love Christ. You see, if these things would creep into us, we will have a problem in viewing church. They would say, there is no real distinction between the reformers and the Catholics. And lastly, another situation where it is difficult for us to obey, but we must obey, is church discipline. Church discipline is a difficult matter because there are always those who have strong emotional ties with people who, have been, who are into discipline. Some always feel sorry for the person being disciplined and is urging people to show grace and mercy and not judgment. Brothers and sisters in Christ, to be effective, church discipline has to be uniformly enforced. If some members continue to fellowship with those who have been disciplined, you are undermining the message. It's the same thing as when parents do not agree, do not stand together on disciplining their children. Children could easily recognize that they can do as they please without any penalty because their mom and their dad disagree on those terms. So obedience to church leadership is equally, especially important if the church has to discipline a sinning member. The second thing, why we should obey and submit to leaders. If you cause them grief, you cause yourself grief. Again, verse 17b, let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. Hebrews 13, 17 states that obedience to godly church is for your benefit. Disobedience to them would be unprofitable for you. God designed authority to protect and bless you. If we disobey godly church leaders who proclaim God's word to you, you are really disobeying God, which always has serious consequences. God is not mocked. But again, it is implicit that these leaders are conscientious men who are walking with God. I assure you, Brothers and sisters in Christ, I remember when I talked to Elder Rex, I told him this is the first time that I have really felt that I am a resident pastor because last year, for nine months, every Saturday, the board of elders meet every Saturday to preach, to study the word of God, to pray for the congregation. We do hermeneutics. We talk about church issues. Every Saturday from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. And I assure you that the members of the board, although they are few, they are men of prayer. They are men of the word. They are men of the faith. They may not be graduates of the seminary, but I can attest that they can rightly divide the word of God, that they can teach and preach here. Spiritual children are like our natural children. They can be the source of immense joy or immense grief. The word grief literally means groaning. Every pastor has had frequent occasion both for joy and for groaning over the people of his flock. Jesus Christ felt that. The apostles felt that, experienced that, both joy and grief. Uh, Apostle John says in John 3, 3 John 4, I have no greater joy than this, to hear of my children walking in the truth. But Paul agonized over the defection of the Galatians from the truth. He was not concerned of his reputation and his welfare, but the welfare of his people and the glory of God. Brothers and sisters in Christ, if you cause your pastor, teachers, shepherd, teachers to groan, it's because they know that your disobedience will damage both you and the name of Christ. And so we should obey our godly leaders because they keep watch over our souls. Because if you 
cause them grief, you are causing yourself grief. Our next responsibility is to pray for godly church leaders in verses 18 and 19. You know, when you read the epistles of uh, Paul, it's very instinctive that he would always ask for prayer. He was so aware of the need of the people to pray for him. And so, for how much more for the rest of us who attempt to serve the Lord? We need your prayers. Paul exclaimed, who is adequate for these things? In our text, the author mentions two areas for prayer. One, pray for leaders in the battle to cultivate a good conscience in all things. That is in verse 18. We have to take an educated guess at what is behind the author's comment in verse 18. But it would be something like this. The author has said some difficult things. And he has confronted the traditionalists who wanted to hold on to their Jewish teachings, their Jewish ways, at the same time trying to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's saying, you cannot do that. You cannot blend your Jewish ways into the faith with faith in the Lord Jesus Christ because God will judge you for diluting the gospel. And so the traditionalists, they are good and Look for sympathizers in the church. This pastor, he has gone too far, saying that the ways of our leaders from the time of Moses are no longer valid. Now the author is saying, I understand how difficult my teachings are, and I ask you to pray for me, because I am sure that my conscience is right before God, and that everything that I have said is to promote the truth of the gospel and also the welfare, the spiritual welfare of the people. Every pastor who is faithful, who stands on the principles of the Bible, has to say or do some things that will offend members of the church. And often it is the traditionalists. We've never done, that way, done it that way, pastor. They will say that he has no respect for the past. They will say that the pastor causes disunity in the church. They will say that the pastor plays favorites. They will even try to work out a compromise so that they can hold on to their cherished trash, uh, beliefs. Even to the point of compromising biblical truth. Under such pressure, some pastors give in and play politics in the church. I won't play politics in the church. Pray for your leaders. That they will stand firm and cultivate a good conscience before God who knows our heart. Pray for leaders to be delivered from circumstances or difficulties beyond their control. Again, verse 19. And I urge you all the more to do this so that I may be restored to you the sooner. The author asked them to pray all the more so that he may be restored to them the sooner. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we don't know the situation of the author. Why was he prevented from visiting them? But it was beyond his control. Perhaps he was sick. And his critics were saying, Oh, see, kung mahal kayo ng pastor nyo, dapat nandirito na siya, dinadalaw kayo. I remember Pastor Nary. He says, I find that critics often judge the pastor because he does not have the gift of omnipresence. But the author's heart was to visit them. And so he asked them to pray. But let us look at what he did. He asked prayer because his request shows that God is greater than all the circumstances we face. And that prayer is our means to take hold of the power of God. And God has ordained prayer. One of the things that God can pour out his blessing and his power to his people. Brothers and sisters in Christ, prayer shows us that we are not competent, that we are insufficient, that we are inadequate unless the Lord works in our lives. It is only one of the ways that God can work in us is through prayer. Brothers and sisters in Christ, how will we apply our text today? First, prepare your heart for church. Taking time during the week or Saturday evenings to pray for me 
or to pray for anyone who will preach here. Pray that your heart would be opened and be submissive to the word of God. Would you spend a few minutes reading the text in its context and meditate on it? Second, pray for me to maintain a good conscience before God and to preach his truth without compromise. Pray for me while I'm preaching that the seed of the word would find fertile soil in the hearts of men. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the legacy of biblical fidelity that we have in the officers of this church. Would you please continue that legacy, we pray, by your grace and mercy for a generation yet to come, even a regeneration yet unborn, that, O oh God, we will tell of the praiseworthy deeds of our God and declare to them mercies which he has shown to us. And I just pray, Lord, for GCFNE in this study on biblical church leadership that they would see this as a gospel issue, that in their also obedience and submission to the leaders, it is one of the ways that you can work and bless and protect the congregation. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.